Chiefs of Staff Pickering released a scathing review last December that criticized security at the U.S. outpost in Libya. However, Pickering said that his board did not look into the controversial and incorrect talking points used by U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Susan Rice after the attack. They were not part of our investigation. They came after the fact, and our investigation was security in Benghazi and the events leading up with respect to security in Benghazi. So there is really nothing I can add from any particular position of expertise on the issue of talking points. This morning, Senator John McCain called the changes to Rice's talking points a, quote, cover-up. Meanwhile, the top Republican on the House Oversight Committee, Chairman Darrell Issa, wants sworn depositions with Pickering and Mullen. Will he get them? Well, Congressman Issa joins us now. Chairman, thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. And, and to be honest, Ambassador Pickering this morning agreed to them. And that's a good step in the right direction to get the record straight as to how they reached decisions on such a narrow basis. One that only holds the lowest level of people responsible while finding 29 specific areas of deficiency, including the building itself the, in which the ambassador died. To you, is an ARB, uh, ARB report t in total, if there wasn't a review of the talking points, why weren't they included? Well, this was a very narrow report required by Congress. There's been 19 of them since 1986, and it's really intended to be, although they call it independent, it's a review requested by and given to the Secretary of State. In this case, this, mis this was a mistake far greater than the Secretary of State. There was no contingent plan even after multiple attacks by the Department of Defense. There were, there were Department of Defense employees that were told to stand down, that they couldn't be part of the relief effort even from within Libya. And ultimately, this report was not allowed to look, as you said, at a lot of things. But here's the, here's the one that our committee finds frustrating. They reached conclusions with a tremendous amount of data and interviews that we've been denied. Well, and today there are Democrats out there on the Sunday shows as well saying Republicans have been given reams of information, thousands of pages of emails and documents that you have what you need. What is it you're still lacking? Well, that becomes so humorous because, first of all, we haven't been given anything. Every day a minder from the State Department comes in with these documents and we can look through them but not take pictures of them, not record anything from them. And we found deficiencies, items that we've been able to get through whistleblowers that are not in that stack of documents. That's not how discovery is done. And in this case, not even the names of the, those injured, those who were present in Benghazi, has been made available to us. So the real fact witnesses that the ambassador said he interviewed, we don't even have the names of them yet. How do you respond to the accusations that this is a political witch hunt that is about going after Democrats and Hillary Clinton in particular and her hopes if she decides to run in 2016? I mean, there are already political groups that are using portions of this investigation and of the hearing in ads going after Hillary Clinton. So how do you refute that that's what this is about? Well, first, first of all, I had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton losing the nomination to a freshman senator named Barack Obama. We don't, we're not playing in the Democratic primary, so we're not even involved in that. Here's what we're involved in. Three career State Department employees came in as qualified whistleblowers, told us things that they knew that the American people should have known from the get-go. And I use the word get-go because Gregory Hicks said within minutes after being told by the now deceased ambassador, Greg, we're under attack. He told the State Department at his levels, all the way to the operations center in Washington, we are under attack, and knew from the get-go it was an Al-Qaeda-backed September 11th attack. And that never got into any report. And certainly, when Secretary Clinton called Gregory Hicks at 2 o'clock in the morning, the next day, September 12th now, in the morning, while the attack was still underway, that was a time in which she could have asked the question, what do you think the attack came from? Saying that the CIA said X, when you get them to change it 12 times, flies in the face of what the top-ranking diplomat said within minutes of the attack. All right, I want you to stick around. When we come back, I want you to answer the question whether there are other whistleblowers in the wings that we may hear from as well. And we're also going to talk about the IRS specifically targeting patriotic groups, Tea Party groups, conservative groups, and uh, where an investigation on that might go. Stick around. Daryl Issa about Benghazi, the explosive hearing this week. One more question on that before we get to another hot topic. Chairman, thank you for sticking around on this. Are there other Benghazi whistleblowers who will come forward now that they've seen this week's hearing? 
Our committee staff has been meeting with many people who are fact witnesses, uh, but a great many of them are afraid to come forward. They're afraid of the kind of treatment that Gregory Hicks and others got once they began saying that they didn't see the story the same as the administration. So we do expect to have some of them come forward. The important thing now is we think we have a breakthrough where the administration will have to let us talk to the other fact witnesses openly, and that's really the right way to do this sort of co-equal investigation. Okay, I want to turn to the IRS a pivot. They admitted and apologized uh, late last week uh, uh, that they looked at groups who were applying for tax-exempt status based on social welfare groups, these 501c4s, uh, and they were looking specifically if there was the word Tea Party, the word Patriot, or 912. They got extra scrutiny and didn't always get approved. If they did, it took months. Uh, what's your take on that, and will we see yet another investigation on that topic? Well, there's an ongoing investigation by the Inspector General that uh, my subcommittee chairman, Jim Jordan, and I requested that he's doing that is the reason for this epiphany of, of asking for forgiveness. And forgiveness comes with a cost. The IRS has to show that there are measures to punish those who did it, and to prevent it from happening in the future. And those are pretty important, particularly after you realize that high-ranking IRS officials knew two years ago that this was going on and continued having denials until a few weeks ago. And what do you make of the fact that there are those who will point to top leaders of the IRS appointed by President Bush and the fact that this was happening on their watch? Well, I think uh, we, we have to look past the partisan part of this. And I think the reason is simple. The American people know that if it could happen to a conservative group today, it could happen to a progressive group tomorrow. I'm old enough to remember when Martin Luther King was targeted by federal authorities for scrutiny. That's not the America any of us want to live in. So fixing this is about fixing it, of course, for those who were targeted, but fixing it for all Americans so they never have to question whether their First Amendment rights essentially land them in an IRS review. I know this week during the Benghazi hearings, there was a lot of talk of bipartisanship and Republicans saying, we don't want this to be about party politics, which you're being accused of, um, but this would be a moment for bipartisanship. To me, it seems that the IRS, you may even have a better argument in getting some of your Democrat colleagues along with you on that because of what you just noted. Well, we expect, uh, and I expect very strongly that Elijah Cummings, my ranking member, and I will be doing this arm in arm uh, for that reason of knowing that in the past, it's been people on his side of the political aisle that have been targeted. And more importantly, for the most part, the, the violations here, there are very few political appointees at the IRS. These are people who are there, who have their own agenda. And was it, was it curtailed by political appointees? That remains to be seen. But was it something inherently wrong within the IRS that needs to be prevented in the future? Absolutely. And particularly as you get into complex computer systems, we have to make sure that somebody isn't dropping something in that hurts a particular group or ideology they oppose. Do you think that there will be pushback uh, on the IRS for other things that it's going to be keeping an eye on, whether it does now or in the future, things related to the new health care law uh, and, and how that may, uh, you know, intersect with people's personal political beliefs. Well, I think you just said it very well. The fact that we've expanded the IRS ro ro <coughs> shows me role under Obamacare is a huge opportunity for an entity that is already somewhat dysfunctional to do more harm. And so we're going to need assurances and institutional changes to make sure this doesn't happen. But we believe that the Inspector General's report is going to help with that, and we expect to work with that arm so that this not be partisan, so that Mr. Cummings and I can push to get the change and then have the administration uh, administer it in a way that, again, keeps par uh, political parties out of it because they'll, someday there'll be a different president. We don't want any administration to be able to do what this one appears to have done. I think all Americans could agree on that, regardless of their party. Chairman Issa, thank you very thank much you. for your time. All right, residents are abandoning their homes as small cracks in the walls